Good morning, or excuse me, good afternoon. Uh, living inside like I'm a cave dweller for the past month has me kind of mixing up my days and nights, and I'm sure I'm not alone uh, compared to some of you. Likewise, I will say this is the first time in a month that I've worn a dress shirt, but I did make a special effort to shave for everybody that came. Um, my name is Drew Sorrell, and I'm a partner at Lounge, and I lead our cybersecurity and privacy group. And then Serge is here, and he'll introduce himself. Hey, good afternoon. Serge Jorgensen. I'm CTO at the Silent Group, a cybersecurity and data forensics firm headquartered in uh, Sarasota. At some point, if you have questions, and I'll reiterate this, we'll do our best to answer them as we go along, and I can see them pop up. So if you see me look over, it's probably because I'm reading your question while I'm talking. So again, we encourage those. Slide, please. We all understand security in one sense as business people as a spend item. How much are we spending? And as a CTO type officer, we understand it too as an appliance and a software and a hardware issue. But at the end of the day, it all breaks down to our friend over here in the, the right hand corner, which is Dave. And Dave is the biggest problem that we all face on a day to day basis. Next page. The question we're trying to answer is what does security mean? Slide. And I'm going to give you a philosophical answer, which is security is a culture shift at most organizations. It's a question of, has the culture embraced what security means? Do you think about culture, do you think culturally about security? Are we a cyber secure organization? In addition to delivering whatever our product is, are we also thinking about the information that we're receiving from our customers and from our employees and making sure that we're keeping all of that secure? And so that's a, a culture question. It has to start at the top with the president's office, the CEO's office, and then trickle all the way down. It's not, in my opinion, just a CIO question. And I think one of the challenges here too is that when we can see it, we've all been really good at, at defending it. And for years, the, the idea of physical security is, um, is a known. But when we introduce cyber and we get this whole logical security and I can't really see it or touch it, how do I secure it? Um, that's always been a challenge. But now with the the mobile workforce and the, the enforced mobile workforce and the work from home environment, that culture has gotten even a little bit more confusing. I agree. And what we're really not talking about is the dictionary definition, because in a sense that has almost no relevance to us on a day-to-day -day basis. Slide, please. And to that point, we're really not talking about some fantastic idea that somebody in IT came up with as to what we should be doing and what that looks like because that's not reality and that's not how these things normally play out. And I'll harken back to the second slide, which was with Dave in the corner as to what happens in reality is not what we normally dream up. This is certainly what we refer to as rubber hose decryption. Um, certainly <laughs> a heck of a lot easier than uh, paying AWS to uh, run a password cracker for 12 years to decrypt something. Right, and I'll point out for the those that don't know that Serge also has a, a military intelligence background, so rubber hose references are probably from his background. <laughs> Next page. Thanks, Drew. You're welcome. <laughs> All right, so there's there's multiple different ways that we can approach the question of what security means to each of us, and. It has different meanings in different contexts. Unfortunately for every organization, it's all of these at the same time. And so you have to look at all of these different questions. And this is where you come up with the synthesis of what it means. And then the question is geography. How does that change everything? And what I mean by that is more or less jurisdiction. So if we in the United States are doing business largely in the United States, say we're a hotel located out on I drive, that's where we physically are located and that's where we take the money from our guests, but do we really? Are we really also implicating all the European guests with GDPR? And so then that then again begs the question, well, what do we have to do about that? What's the standard? So next, next slide. So breach of contract, there's two kinds of contracts I'm talking about in this context. The first is the express and the second is the implied contract. With an express contract, that's the one that you pull out of the drawer and you say, this is exactly what we signed. This is the piece of paper that we signed with the vendors that we work with and with our big clients. And this says exactly or doesn't say anything about what the security has to be with respect to the information we're passing back and forth. Now, with respect to the implied contract, that is the one that arises when you don't actually expressly define in your contracts 
what the responsibilities of each party is with respect to security and to privacy. The same is also true, and this is where you see a lot of class action litigation as to the implied contract with the people that we do, to do business with on a day-to-day -day basis. So for instance, if we are doing business with, let's assume that we're Disney because we're right next to Disney, they sell tickets every day and they collect information from folks. And when Disney does that, is there really an express contract with 15 pages and two subparts and an exhibit saying this is how we handle security? And the answer to that is no, there's really not. What there is is an implied agreement that the courts are beginning to recognize with respect to what reasonable security is as to that data. And so you have to think about all of the implications. And then you go into different nuances of what negligence is all about and then for statutory requirements and so on. Um, next slide. With respect to the statutory requirements, the other question you have to look at is if a regulator is coming in, do I have to think about what their gloss is and how they've tended to enforce their own statutes? And unfortunately, from an organizational standpoint, that can mean a regulator just about anywhere in the world. Or if you're US based, that also includes what I will call the proactive jurisdictions, which there are four or five in the United States that if you do business with their citizens, even if you're out of state, they will take a very close look at what you've done under their own statutory rubric to define and analyze under their, again, their regulations, what they think is appropriate or not, which is one of those unintended consequences of doing business in an internet world. Um, the last piece is the risk adjustment. This also can mean different things in different contexts, but in essence, it's usually a question of organizational analysis of what the consequences would be to the organization if we were to have a data breach of some sort and what the likelihood of enforcement is. And again, this is one of those synthetic answers, which is what does it mean? It means we need to think about what all of the risks are and how we're going to address them or choose, frankly, to not address them because not everything can afford a million dollar uh, software appliance to protect. Some things don't merit that protection. And so you have to risk, you have to adjust what you're doing based on the risk. Yeah, this is a this Sorry. is an interesting area too, where um, Drew and I both participate in a, a legal think tank institute, Sedona, uh, which gives us an opportunity to interact with some of the regulators. You know, Drew from a legal perspective, and me from a, a more technical cybersecurity perspective, and it really is interesting talking to some of the regulators sometimes of what they think is reasonable versus what we see as practitioners as reasonable. And, and that dialogue certainly proactively with them is, is useful, uh, but also something that you know, when you look at it and say, am, am I doing what's reasonable for my company? And especially everyone recognizes we got scattered to the four winds and everyone's working from home now, but that doesn't really change the regulator's view of what's reasonable because consumers still need protection. So they're still gonna establish and, and expect that certain degree of uh, reasonableness benchmark. And I agree. And that's where I see actually a lot of friction when I'm dealing with clients is a lawyer's and a regulator, because most of the time the regulators are lawyers, analysis of what is reasonable is a lot different than what a CTO or CIO's analysis is. And what I mean by that is very specific is you, at, you walk into a given company, different organization, and you say, well, what are you doing with respect to XYZ issue? And they say, well, this is how we deal with it. And usually it's a thought out specific process that they have. And then as a lawyer, if, unless it's written, it doesn't exist. And then I ask, well, can you show me the document where it's written down that that's what you do? And the answer frequently is, well, I just know that's what it is and that's what happens. And so that's where you see some of the friction, I think, as far as the different perspectives on risk. And there's a balance between know what to do, write it down, and then be ISO compliant where you can get lost in the maze of paperwork. And I think that's kind of exemplified in this slide too, but finding that perfect middle ground is where I think Drew, your background really comes into play of what's actionable in this and, and how can I determine reasonable without extreme, but also without negligent. And, and I agree. And like you were saying, this slide, I think, while it's kind of funny, it actually is pretty true in that if you look on the left-hand side back in 1990, the, the concept of what a password should be was what it was. Then it gets, well, it needs to be complex. 
and then you move along and it, it gets and it continues to advance the evolution of passwords and then finally on the right hand side you end up with where we are sort of today which is a complex password coupled with multi-factor authentication and all that is a way of saying security and what is reasonable is something that evolves and it has to be revisited over and over again which is usually one of the things that the different security frameworks talk about is making sure that you revisit and think about. Um, one other, other thing I'll say is that I'm willing to bet that about half of you actually song, sang the rest of that song that's in the 2010 lyric that's floating above her head. <laughs> but you know, I think this is a really good example too of even though we're forced to, to be working remotely right now, um, maybe when I had a two-factor, multi-factor authentication being um, factor one, my butt was in a seat in the office, and factor two, my password was Zeppelin. Um, now, all of a sudden, when I'm working remotely and that password works from anywhere in the world, if we end up responding to an incident and we do a forensic analysis and investigation and find out that the attackers used somebody's credentials, um, and worst case in, in our book, because IT professionals would be if they used an IT account, a Surface account that hadn't been changed in 20 years and didn't have multi-factor authentication on it. Um, that's when you can start getting to that bar of everyone looks at you and goes, really? It is 2016 plus and we right. should be using something. Um, now, maybe the password doesn't need to be as complex once we have that multi-factor, that code in place. And that's that NIST guidance recently is, you know, hey, maybe a less complex password or at least a less random password when combined with multi-factor authentication is perfectly acceptable. And just adding just a little bit more gloss to that, what seems to be evolving in the law right now is not so much did you make the perfect decision so much as did you actually give it some due consideration? And we're not necessarily going to criticize you for the ultimate answer that your judgment led you to. But what we are going to do is if you chose not to think about it, that's when you get penalized. So next slide. So all this is great and wonderful, but it doesn't really help you with respect to what does that mean in our work from home world. And so that's what we'll talk about next with respect to planning a span of control. And I think there are more or less five things that we should talk about. The first of which is communications. And next slide, please. I think that every organization needs to take a breath right now and make sure that they have given some thought with respect to where you find yourself, which usually is in your home or your condo or wherever, um, about how they are going to make sure that communications are secure. And that means a couple of different things. It means A, I need to understand what applications all of my employees are now using to communicate and what level of information they're communicating on those platforms and case in point is Zoom. Everybody has been writing barrels of ink about whether or not Zoom is secure or not. I will tell you candidly, I have staked a claim um, that Zoom is good enough for most things. The problem is you need to pay attention to what you're talking about. If I were, and I, this is, I guess, I guess hyperbole, but if I were planning to take over a third world country, I don't think I would use Zoom. If on the other hand, I'm just talking about what the HR committee is going to be doing for the party now that it's been moved, I think Zoom is plenty fine. Um, the other part of that is what are you doing with respect to communications processes as they relate to money and more sensitive subjects? So for instance, more than ever, people are sending emails and to some extent using instant messaging, but what you should be doing is thinking about when money's being transferred back and forth or security's being changed, what are you doing to make sure you secure, your communications are secure? And so again, easy example of that is if you wanna do a wire, you should not only have a piece of paper in a metaphorical sense, some kind of written communication, but it should be coupled with a secondary validation, which usually the easiest way to do that is to pick up the phone and call. So I've got John Doe saying that we need to authorize and move $100,000 from account one to accounts payable. I need to pick up the phone before that money actually moves and both parties understand that and have talked about it first so that A, John Doe knows that if he just sends me an email, it's not gonna happen unless I get a secondary approval, meaning him calling or I calling him. We establish that we are who we are and we then talked about 
what's going to happen so that we can try and cut out the middleman attack, which is the redirected and the phishing and the spoofing kind of thing. And all of that, I think, requires companies to take a breath now that you've gotten to work from home and to make sure that you've given thought to those different types of policies. And especially now that the attackers are becoming more aware of those as well. So in the past year, we've seen attackers not just changing wire instructions to pile on Drew's analogy there, but then also to, in that email, um, use your signature block, but change the phone number in the bottom of it. So if you actually use the phone number in the email to call the person, you're talking to the attacker. So it's um, definitely getting more sophisticated and that's where putting, I think to Drew's point, conscious effort and thought on all of our parts. It's not, uh, we can't just relegate this to what traditionally has been IT and uh, cybersecurity teams. It really becomes something that all of us from leadership on down need to be cognizant of. Right, next slide please. So data access is what we're gonna talk about next. And, and with respect to data access, I like to refer to basically the Yoda of security and there's a picture of him on the next slide, please. So yes, indeed, 1978, the who came up with what is probably the most important question that you can ask when it comes to data security, which is who are you? And I know now again, that you're all thinking about rock and rock and roll and not security, but this is the question that is on the topic at hand. Next slide, please. So the question is, again, we talked a little bit about multi-factor authentication, but the question is who has access to what in your organization? And to some extent, when everybody's working in relatively the same geography, meaning the office or uh, two different office buildings, but everything is defined and usual and common and we have established protocols and procedures, all of that's great, but now that you've moved everybody out and the key question was we need to get everybody with access so that they can do their jobs remotely. Well, did you think about who has access to the data, how much access they have to the data? Again, using my favorite John Doe person, does John Doe have access to everything that's on the uh, database related to accounts payable? Does John Doe need access to everything that's on the accounts payable or information system? and so on. And so you take a look at that and then you have to ask the secondary question, which is the reality of working from home. I now have a home office that I never had before and my employee does too. Is my employee being cautious and careful about who in their house has access to the information? Are they leaving their systems wide open? Is there credit card information? Do you know who's living with them? It's a COVID kind of world. And so you have people that don't usually living, live together, living together and so on. So again, the question is who and who has control and access. Next slide. And then the next question is the obvious, which is data retention. Next slide. Again, this is kind of playing off of the same theme. You have a remote office you normally would have John Doe sitting in their office with a computer that's issued by the company. Sometimes that's the case now, sometimes that's the case not. And so the question again is, what is John Doe doing with the data, albeit legitimately, what is John Doe doing with the data that's on the system that they have at home? If it's a home computer, have they now saved to the home computer desktop all of the information about the employee's social security numbers and benefits plan? Even if they're doing that for a valid reason, is that really where you want that information? And what are you gonna do once you stop working from home to make sure that all that information is pulled back and it doesn't reside on this uh, old desktop computer that eventually is gonna reach end of life and John Doe is going to dispose of? Question being, of course, what is John Doe going to do to dispose of it and the hard drive and the information that's on it? Next slide. This one doesn't really change a whole lot based on where we're working, except for the following point, which is if there is a data breach incident, it used to be that you could walk down the hall and communicate with the people that you needed to communicate with. Now you have a situation where do you have the telephone number for the people that you need to talk to in case there is a data loss, if there's a data breach, so for instance, I'm working at home, something bad happens, maybe I'm burglarized, whatever, and my laptop is stolen, 
who am I going to communicate with? Because what I can't do necessarily is go into the office and ask someone. I need to actually be able to talk to someone who knows what to do about that. And then in turn, the question for them is, can they get a hold of the people that they need to know? For instance, do they know how to get a hold of Surge, given that we're all working remotely? Surge is the guy I'm going to call to try and tell me how bad the loss is, where the whether the bad guys are still in the system and so on. And I need to understand what Surge's limitations will be if during COVID I need to call him and, and to work with him. Next slide. I have a special suit for that. <laughs> I can see you in a bunny suit walking into the IT department trying to do your job. Um, so the next question, again, this is a theme that I think has actually even more importance now than it ever did, which is training, making sure that you've come up with how to assure that employees know what to do and are more than ever paying attention to phishing scams and the other different artifices that are coming out. The, the one that I heard most recently that is kind of common sense, but it's something that needs to be reinforced is actually Zoom meetings have been weaponized where an employee will get a Zoom meeting invite with a click, a link to click. They click the link and instead of being a Zoom meeting, it's like your typical old fashioned spear phishing bank email saying there's a problem with your account, click here. Now you get a Zoom meeting invite. So the point of that is training should go on and perhaps you should send to your organization just a warning to let people know what the latest and greatest is with respect to what the bad guys are doing. So you know too, Drew, that's, that's a really good example too of something that uh, can be overinflated because the, the issue there was that attackers were into calls and were starting to send around links that when you click on them, um, sure, it could certainly be a phishing email going out to a different site, but the ones that seemed most effective for them and the ones that we ended up dealing with a number of times were the links to a document on your uh, on your corporate network. So the link would be to something, you know, whack, whack, computer name, whack, uh, folder name, file name. And when you clicked on it, it would pop up a prompt for your username and password. And it was some, effectively a Microsoft provided prompt, but the problem was that Zoom was uh, capturing that and transmitting some of that data through the channel so that an attacker could get a copy of that. Now I have your username and password. If, like the previous slide was suggesting, you have multi-factor in place, then, oh well, somebody has your password. If the attackers are able to leverage the combination now of events that they have your password it's just a new way of getting your password and they're able to use that password to get to something that matters now you've created a problem right agree next slide please and this is my training slide and if you weren't watching movies in the 80s this is really not going to resonate with you but i will tell you that the guy on the right um won an emmy and a tony and the guy on the left won two oscars um, and that happens to be, I think, a uh, anchovy and blue cheese pizza that he ordered so that he could have some pizza on our time, Mr. Hand. Anyway, all the useless knowledge we That's have. That's you in the second row, isn't it, Drew? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, with respect to, um, I'm, I'm reading a question. So the, the question, uh, this is actually topical, so let's, let's talk about it briefly. Um, it says, I've received some emails from a known vendor company saying that we've outstanding invoices and it turns out it's a phishing link and not an employee of theirs. How can we eliminate these from happening? And do you want to talk about that, Serge? Yeah, sure. I think there's two possible answers. One is that the attackers and attacker has gotten into their mailbox and is sending something out. And at that point, it's really hard to eliminate because now you're trying to make sure that your vendor's mailboxes are secure. And the best defense is just the internal training and the not click on links and make sure that you understand where the links go and everything else. The other possibility is that an attacker is spoofing the vendor's uh, domain name. And we see certainly a lot of that turning I's into L's and L's into I's and N's into M's and things like that. And so it looks like it's coming from the vendor, but it's not really. And those emails are likely to be picked up by a good mail filter. Um, and you certainly, uh, the mail filtering companies like a Proofpoint or a Mimecast would be two of our favorites, um, are working hard to 
try to identify males like that and um, and squash them before it gets to you. Um, of course, if you do that user training to uh, to make sure that users are aware of what to look for and encourage them just to slow down a little bit, that helps as well. And then finally, um, the uh, the tags on the emails that say external email, do not click on links, can just be a reminder for the users and a training point for you to say, hey, if you see this, um, it's certainly not internal, which addresses the, the ones that we see where it's a very similar spoof to this, but uh, attackers have spoofed your own domain name and then are sending emails what, what look to be internal emails, but are actually not. So good mail filters usually pick that up. There's certainly ones out there and um, mail filters that aren't as, uh, as effective and then user training, unfortunately, and it comes back to Dave in the corner from Drew's first slide. And one other thing I'll say is, well, two actually things I'll say. What, what Serge is describing is more or less layered defense. Um, and that's how it's referred to. And what that means is that you've got multiple different ways to try and uh, mitigate those types of dangers, two or three of which Serge just talked about. Another thing that you can also do is a geographic um, addressment of more or less geofencing. I'm hearing lawnmowers outside, so I apologize if that's coming through. Um, but geofencing can help with that as well. Uh, and talk to your IT folks about exactly the details of that. Uh, next slide. I don't particularly have anything to, to talk about on this slide. I just thought it was kind of funny, um, especially coming from a lawyer. So there you go. I think the next slide then turns over to Serge's portion of the presentation and I'll stick around, but Serge is gonna talk now. Thank you. Yeah, sure. And just thanks, Drew. Wanted to run through briefly uh, Silent Group, as I said earlier, a cybersecurity data forensics company. But um, we are one of 10 companies accredited by the NSA for incident response and one of 12 that deals with or approved by the card brands for payment card forensic investigations. So we get involved in a lot of bleeding edge type activities. Uh, critical infrastructure attacks, as well as uh, organized crime attacks against the uh, uh, various level merchants dealing with credit card issues. Um, so we see a lot of different intrusions, a lot of different attacker techniques and uh, methodologies, and just wanted to step through a few of them and also provide some thoughts and guidance on uh, issues that you may be facing right now. So if we can get the next slide, uh, the three main areas I was going to try to get into was environmental challenges, issues that you may see with data, and then attacker threats. And next slide, please. So the, the problem I know that most of people are facing in that workforce environment right now is that kids are home from school. Uh, there, well, there is no school anymore, so how you're dealing with that uh, becomes an added challenge. And I think one of the, the unique challenges there is commingling and, and how do you deal with those restrictions? Um, so we had a case, it's been a few years now, where uh, a uh, happened to be a dad was working at home from his computer, kid came over, uh, took a USB uh, stick out of a computer, stuck in their mouth and sucked on it for a little while and then plugged it back into the computer and computer, hard drive, motherboard, everything just shorted out. And so we got the call from a data recovery perspective of. Uh, can you help me recover and, and rebuild and find all this data that I was working on? Um, and the answer was no. I, I have no idea what was in this kid's saliva, but it just exploded and, and blew everything. Um, so the uh, um, ended up creating some additional challenges. The the uh, one of the issues there is, is how do you deal with that? And we'll get into some considerations in a minute. The next slide too is another example of uh, just video conferences, and this was. Um, you know, if you haven't done it yet, then certainly you can Google uh, video conference fails and you see all of these uh, videos of people that have had terrible things happen to them. Um, obviously, Tony here will now go down in infamy uh, for wearing boxers to his conference call and then getting up and having a nice stretch while still on the, uh, <laughs> on the, uh, on the call. So it's really just being aware of your equipment and operationally keeping track of how everything works. Um, certainly the, the cameras on laptops today make it kind of hard to tell sometimes whether they're on or not. So being aware of that and, 
and preparing for that. In the next slide, in the consideration side of things, um, I would say trying to define a workspace. Um, and if you notice, Drew's, Drew has a background behind him that's put in place by, uh, by Zoom and allows him to put a background back there to hide his uh, very legal looking bookshelf. If he didn't have one there, you'd see some great books and um, all his research materials, I'm sure, back there. Um, for me, there's applications out there. I'm using XSplit is the name of the application and it just allows you to blur out your background. So it's a little bit less conference call dependent and a camera option for uh, reducing some of those uh, both noise in the background, but also uh, kids that may walk by or uh, inappropriate pictures that might be hanging on your wall, all sorts of things that we've certainly seen over the past couple of months as people are getting used to this work from home environment. One of the other areas really is trying to define a workspace and kids do really well, I've found over the years with imagination. So um, telling them that uh, your office is off limits may be a little bit harder to deal with, but setting up some physical barriers, crime scene tape, kids always love it. Okay, so I'm gonna string crime scene tape around my couch and that's where my office is gonna be while I'm, I'm working from home. And I'll come out of the crime scene to, uh, to go to you, but you can't come into the crime scene um, to uh, to come to me uh, and just really establishing those boundaries and learning and knowing their equipment can help get over some of these environmental challenges that we're dealing with as well from an employer perspective uh, suggesting or requiring or giving your employees the crime seat tape and saying here as part of your work from home process uh, we would request that you set up a specific area for uh, your office and your work from home area if you don't already have one because that can help with the next slide here of the data issues side of things. If we can get the next slide, we can get into the data issues. Um, and here really we start looking into what else can happen. So you're now working from home and we can certainly uh, damage machines, damage equipment, um, we can uh, move things back and forth from the office I know people were given an hour or two and certain larger companies, they were saying, hey, if you need anything from the office, you're allowed to come into the office for 15 minutes for an hour and you can get whatever you need and transport it home. But then we have an unencrypted uh, transportation problem and, uh, and some considerations that we really need to, to, con to deal with there. One of the largest data breaches in Florida, HIPAA related data breaches, was uh, when a, a radiology lab decided that they were gonna go paperless and they um, prepared everything and scanned their documents and got it all set up. And then they brought in the waste disposal company to transport all of their documents from their office to the incinerator. And one of these trucks drove off, the back of the truck was unlatched and paper started blowing down the street and being chased by doctors and nurses. And in the, the HIPAA filing, it was, it was a windy day and they weren't sure whether or not they recovered all the papers. So they had to notify everyone because they couldn't figure out what was in, what was in a particular truck or in a particular box. So it just, it really goes to drive home that point of, um, it doesn't have to be cyber related. Unencrypted transportation is, is a danger. Well, and it also highlights having given some thought to your contract with whoever the vendor is to make sure that you've thought about some of the things that can go wrong and what's going to happen if it does go wrong. A, how do you respond to it? And then B, who's responsible for paying for it being the kind of the key questions that go in a lot of contracts or should go in a lot of contracts, but frequently aren't. Well, absolutely. Um, and, and some get out of jail free cards. I know, Drew, you can probably talk to better than I, but if your laptop is encrypted, and you lose it, then you have a, a more clear line from a regulator perspective of you know, if the data is at risk. Right, and there's a lot of statutes actually that define out of a data breach those things which are encrypted or that otherwise have give the, the possessor who lost it a reasonable belief that it's unusable data. Um, what that doesn't mean is that while well, we lost a SQL database and because it requires SQL probably can't use it, that's not reasonable. But what it would include is password protection and encrypted uh, drives and things like that. So that would be your get out of jail free card. And the other thing, Drew, you brought up COVID uh, earlier, 
but I would say just from that original data issues slide, um, the, the thought of data like coronavirus being really, really contagious. Um, mm -hmm. Just everything that it touches leaves a, a fingerprint. And as a cybersecurity and a forensics firm, oftentimes what we end up getting involved in is, hey, I had this USB stick, I plugged it into my home computer to get a file off of it and accidentally transferred a bunch of documents that are uh, were part of the work environment. And now I'm stuck in that position that Drew was talking about earlier, where a year from now, two years from now, we actually start seeing the fallout of the events of today because you dispose of that home computer not thinking about that it has your, uh, your business environment on it. The case that we dealt with a few months ago, uh, somebody was working from home and uh, had uh, their, their son was playing a video game that had peer-to-peer -peer chats and allowed FTP for uploading files back and forth. And so the firewall was open to allow this communication. Dad comes in, plugs in the, the principal of the school, plugs in their computer with all the student records and student information on it. And somebody finds it, scrolling across the internet, uh, sent some links to it, Google crawled it, and all of a sudden on Google were lists of all of this student information. So the, the unintended consequences of data being very contagious and, and spreading across uh, different areas like that. Right, there's actually a FTC, Federal Trade Commission enforcement action that's fa fairly infamous that it's called LabMD that has the same basic fact pattern, which is that an employee had what was the equivalent of LimeWire or Napster installed on their work computer and that because it's an FTP file sharing site allowed client, meaning in this case, lab analysis of patient data to be crawled and to be downloaded through file sharing. Um, and then of course the FTC took enforcement action and last I heard LabMD is now bankrupt because of the costs associated with that. So, you know, if we could go back one slide too, there was, I wanted to pick up the trade secret disclosure issue as well. Thanks. Um, and you really, I guess, asked probably drew some questions uh, in terms of uh, from a corporate environment, I have a lot of physical and cyber protections around trade secrets. Mm -hmm. Certainly from a work from home environment, I may not have those, uh, the same, uh, same protections. And I know trade secrets and the viability of the trade secret, a lot of that has to do with making sure that it's secure and that I'm keeping it reasonably safe and protected. So just another concern, concern and consideration if you, as you start working from home is how are you tracking that trade secret data and protecting it? Right, and I agree. And you recall several slides back where we were talking about the access issues, meaning are you giving access to John Doe such that John Doe can now access every part of the system remotely. And when you're doing a trade secret analysis, one of the questions that is asked by the court is if you took reasonable precautions to make sure that your trade secrets were protected and not widely known, not distributed, did you take enforcement action and so on. Um, I do not think that well, it was the time of COVID is going to ring really well with the jury or with the judge when they're considering these questions. I think it's going to continue to be where you're reasonable and you may get a little bit of sympathy for the first couple of days, but I think now that the dust has begun to settle, I think there's going to be a retrenchment into are you doing reasonable things to secure this type of data, especially with trade secrets and so on, to make sure that it doesn't reside um, on the local drives of your employees forever to be disposed of willy-nilly. One of the challenges too in the personal use and business use of devices that really comes into play and, and we see a number of, of uh, cases and incidents that we end up responding to that comes out of this is that commingling on uh, either devices or, or business use of home devices because that's all you have at the moment. So I saw yesterday somebody joined a uh, teams meeting and their uh, daughter's name was the name on the, the teams meeting and it turns out was because the daughter has uh, is a student in school and it's the their account that was logged into the computer uh, but now everything that's typed into a chat window and everything that's high end and uploaded back and forth in that meeting is going and available to that daughter's account 
So yeah. unintended consequences. And these are all the things that, again, I think now need to be thought through. And, and there's also the other piece of this too, which is depending on the system and how you're doing it, you have virus issues too, in the sense of the malware or just straight old viruses, um, ransomware and so on. We've so seen a really good one in January, uh, maybe as a foreshadowing of things to come. Really good. You don't mean that like everybody else does. You know that, right? <laughs> it's job security. It's, okay. you know, it's, okay. um, so the uh, trick bot is a type of mm -hmm. uh, malware that's been out there for many years as a banking malware. And it's just a very well-written, well-crafted piece of malware that's good at and worming its way through systems and extracting system data once it's uh, once it's established and embedded on a machine. And in uh, January, we saw the threat actors update that malware with some additional capability that was really interesting and well thought out from their perspective. Um, the uh, what the malware does, it sits on your computer, and it was really targeted at people's home computers. And when you add a, a cell phone to that computer, so if I plug my Android cell phone in to charge it into the computer, the TrickBot malware to recognize that Android is plugged in and pop up a, a message saying, hey, there's an antivirus package available for your Android. Uh, would you like to, uh, to download it? If you say yes, it says, what's your phone number? And then it texts the link to your Android and you can go ahead and download it. The only problem was, is, was that it's not a legitimate antivirus program, but instead it is designed to collect multi-factor authentication credentials from your phone. Uh, so the rolling codes and everything else that, uh, that occur in the background on your phone would now be accessible for the attackers to use to get into systems. So it's the, uh, that integration between business and personal becomes even more important just to be thoughtful and, and to go into with some uh, consideration. Right. And next slide, please. I think we talked through uh, the considerations a little bit already here, but a couple thoughts and, uh, and additional recommendations, I guess. One is keeping those systems segregated. One that we'd seen for years and that actually we got involved in a few trade secret cases was the uh, iCloud. And now with OneDrive, we're just probably going to see a flurry of cases with OneDrive as well, where the uh, iCloud account is actually owned by the person, but just attached to the Mac OS, whether tablet or, or laptop or desktop during the install process and the initiation process. Um, but when the person moves companies and attaches that iCloud account to their next company, all of the data that's sitting in that previous account now gets pulled over into potentially a new corporate computer. Um, so the, the system segregation is really important. Data encryption from that standpoint, we talked about the importance of that encryption and, and certainly the get out of jail free card. Um, but I would also say the opposite becomes um, very difficult if you really think through it. Um, we get frequent, frequent uh, um, statements that there was nothing on a laptop, therefore I didn't have to encrypt it. And we have a regulator that's asking Drew saying, well, Drew, uh, your client says there was nothing on it. Can you prove that? What did they have access to? And could they have downloaded an Excel sheet with people's uh, W-2 numbers or a list of employees or anything like that, or, or PII, or could they have run a report of all of the patients for the past month and put that on their system. And frequently the answer is they could have, and they weren't supposed to. Right. And, and then we're stuck with, well, did they? And we're going, well, give me the laptop and I can tell you exactly what they did. Well, the laptop stole it. Well then, I don't know, maybe they did. And the, the problem that, and I actually heard a couple of regulators speak just recently on that very issue. And you'll be shocked to hear that regulators take a very different view of what probable is. And so if I'm an organizational attorney and we lose a laptop and the question is, well, what was on the laptop? Was any of it sensitive? And my client says, we don't really know. 
my answer to that as the defense attorney is, well, there's no way to know, and it's unlikely, therefore, that we can do anything about this, just, you know, kind of shorthanding a whole bunch of discussion. And then the predictable response of the regulators is more along the lines of, well, then you should assume that everything in the world was on it and let everybody know. And those are two very different positions and different dollar signs attached to them. Um, and it amps up the need for policies related to scripting, related to logging, related to access control and download control and things like that. All of which to try and get yourself in the we don't know situation into the we do know and it wasn't that important situation. So, go on, Serge, sorry. No, no worries. The, the last piece on here really was the, uh, the personal wireless router. And that's just something that can provide that segmentation maybe between your home wireless where you may have kids playing Minecraft, World of Warcraft and everything else and your corporate environment. Um, but also it, it can be used when traveling and providing some isolation between Starbucks wireless and your computer or hotel wireless and your computer. So uh, a Wi-Fi router of some sort, like, uh, uh, I don't know, a, a TP-Link or any number of, of wireless routers can be pretty easy for a, um, a general user, computer user to set up and provide just one additional level of, of uh, separation from the rest of that wireless environment that you might be operating in. Um, so next slide, please, and we can get into some of the uh, threat actor techniques and, um, and procedures that they use. And really here wanted to emphasize the difference between what we saw or what people envision as hackers and maybe what we saw 20 years ago of uh, some person sitting on their couch uh, late at night and uh, staring at a computer screen and trying to, trying to hack away versus the, the epitome of businesses and organized crime. One of the groups that we were working with uh, the law enforcement agencies and breaking up for the last couple of years when the law enforcement got in some of their computers and started looking at some of their systems and some of their finances uh, they were estimated to be making about 50 million dollars a month so we're talking about half billion dollar organizations they use jira for project management they use uh, mailchimp for for sending out leads to other people it's, it's a standard um, protocols and, and procedures that we might see in a normal business, uh, tracking revenue and, and certainly sitting around a table like this saying, hey, our ransomware revenue is down 15%. Why is that? And what do we need to do to, uh, to get people in clicking on our tools again and getting their machines infected? Or, or how are IT uh, resources able to recover without paying us for ransom? So what do we need to do? Oh, well, hey, I have an idea. Maybe we should exfiltrate data um, at the same time as we're encrypting data so that even if people don't pay us for the key, they'll still have to pay us to not uh, post data online. Congratulations, you get a 20% bonus this year. Um, and the rest of you, I'm gonna take you out and shoot you and, um, and get some new developers to, to bring this in. And now we have Maze ransomware where that's exactly what they're doing. Maybe not the shooting part, but definitely the exfiltration part. So if we look at some uh, uh, some ideas here, and next slide, please, we can get into phishing emails. And I think the the challenge here, hopefully, if we had this person saying, please click on this link, uh, none of us would go, oh yes, I'll just enter my password there. But the phishing emails are getting better and better. Certainly the earlier question about uh, getting something with a spoof domain name and it might be off just a little bit is hard to detect and you're more likely to click on that, you're more likely to trust it. We're seeing attackers weaponize documents that you have to open, it's your job to open. Uh, certainly food service business, a lot of the uh, complaints about restaurants uh, right now with COVID-19, there was a big campaign that was traced back to some Russian groups um, offering at information about COVID-19 and tracking the, the pandemic and, and uh, infecting machines that way. So having that extra care, having a good mail filter in place, um, and then educating those users, but also to Drew's point about having 
defense in depth or layered defenses there. So I can have a mail filter, which hopefully prevents the phishing email from getting to the end user. I can have some training, which hopefully prevents the user from clicking on this or, or when they see this, they maybe go, oh, maybe I should not enter my password here. Uh, but then what? If they do enter their password, do I have multi-factor authentication as that additional layer? Um, or if I, um, do I have a web proxy maybe? So that if somebody does click on a link and the computer starts trying to go out to a website that is suspicious, is something going to get in the way and, and pop up either warn the user or um, let IT know or let security know that uh, this computer may be trying to go somebody place suspicious. It would also speed up that investigation so that you can then look at that web proxy and say, oh, it wasn't just this one user that reported it, it was these 12 other users that clicked on it, entered the password and never said anything. Um, so doing that analysis can be really uh, critical there. In the next slide too, we get into some of the mobile device attacks uh, that we're seeing. And this is certainly, we're talking about the uh, uh, the trick bot attack against the Android devices and collecting that multi-factor authentication from those devices, which is becoming more and more frequent attacks. Uh, there's, I've seen some estimates that 60, 70% of the antivirus programs out there for mobile devices are actually not antivirus programs, but are rather malware released by uh, threat actors. Uh, Kaspersky, uh, many of you have probably heard of Kaspersky AV for desktops, they had an antivirus, well, <laughs> there was an antivirus program on the Google Play Store for years before Kaspersky had a uh, antivirus solution for mobile. It was just masquerading as their solution, <laughs> like collecting that data. So it's um, that extra level of care and, and concern. Um, in the next slide too, we can go through a little bit about um, what attackers are trying to do and what the, what's the end game for all of this. So in the bottom left here, um, just a quick uh, screenshot of a uh, encrypting malware. So a ransomware chat window. So if you get encrypted, this is coming out of uh, Soda Nokabi, it's a type of, mal of ransomware. Um, and when the, uh, the encryption happened, you're told to go to this website and you can chat with the attackers. They will upload your decryptor key right here. They can adjust the price. There's the countdown clock for you. And when you say, okay, I, I think I'm gonna pay, they're very polite, thank you, uh, happy to help. Do you have any problems running your decryptor? Um, they want you to be successful and get your data back, uh, but they also want to pay a million dollars, 114 Bitcoin in this case. So it's certainly something to, to be aware of that that ransomware is really, uh, it's ransomware as a service at this point, instead of something sitting on the couch coding away. And to your point, it, we have truly shifted from a situation where it's um, some kid screwing around, kitty coder type person messing around with passing out viruses because it's funny to legitimate high stakes, business focused, bad guys in organized crime. And to Serge's point, the, the ransomware these days is much more sadly business-like and it does have help desk capabilities with, if you can't decode, let us help you decode because we want you to be satisfied. And the reason for that is because bad guys want people to think if I do this and I pay them the money, I do get my data back and they'll help me to get my data back. And that's because, shocking, it's a good business practice. Um, and so it's truly become a situation where there's so much money to be made that the attacks have become so much more sophisticated than they were even five years ago. Um, that the ramping up and training and then the legitimate paying attention to security as a, as a defense is so much more critical now because of the vectors of attack and the sophistication. So we have that for direct monetization. We have the, the plans the, for jet engines and things like that, where from an, from an organizational perspective or from a nation state perspective, if I can cut my research and development budget mm -hmm. and instead just steal the plans and steal the development, 
then I can deliver that product a lot cheaper and compete on an international ma market where maybe I couldn't have if I had to do the R&D myself. The middle one there uh, is, uh, is cryptocurrency mining. So Bitcoin mining, Monero mining, whatever it might be. The interesting part about that, if you look at that um, graph in a little bit more detail, you can see it's telling you how much you're mining per day based on some processor power. And then on the right side, it's telling you how much power is costing. So your power costs per month are $12,000 per month for that, that power. And you're gonna make, after paying for power, about $1,500 a month. Now, $1,500 a month, most of us would say, you know what, that's maybe not worth setting up the mining and everything else. But if I can mine it with somebody else's environment, so if I can hack into your system, put some mining software on there, let you pay for the power, all of a sudden I'm making fourteen, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 a month. Now I'm making pretty good money and I can sit there and repeat that over and over again. And then finally, again, back from that nation state or, um, or really organized crime and, and the threads that connect organized crime to nation states and some of the countries, uh, Russia uh, certainly being in that category, uh, but some other states coming online too. Um, if I can get some information about potential upcoming mergers and acquisitions, um, can I beat you to the punch? Or can I um, offer you just the right amount? Or can I uh, predict and then make some money on the stock market based on the, uh, the plans there. So a lot of different end games for the attackers, but it's not all about just sending out that next spam and, and scan um, and email. And then the last slide here is just uh, a general recommendation of question everything. And I'll turn it back over to Drew for uh, anything else to do with tinfoil hats. <laughs> next slide, please. And because of the format of this, we don't really have a Q&A set up. Um, I think we've answered the questions that were uh, typed in that haven't been said. If you have a follow-up question, you want to shoot an email to, to me or to Serge or our marketing department at the firm, we'll be happy to route it to you and put you in touch with Serge or again with me. Um, so again, thank you for taking time out um, of your day living at home and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.